Music is my passion. And to this date, it still remains a huge part of my life. It set the scene not only for my drive and hunger to succeed, but it was also the starting point for me to embrace my emotions and connect with empathy. I was intrigued with the piano at a very early age and wanted to challenge myself by mastering one of the most difficult instruments. Pianos cover all 88 notes of the musical scale, unlike other instruments, offering an incredible, unparalleled range. Playing the piano necessitates coordinating the hands, which are mirror images of each other. Not satisfied with just the piano, I asked my parents whether I could get a flute after hearing James Galway perform. Eventually, my goal was to learn an instrument from each of the orchestral sections, and I subsequently picked up the cello. Given my mixed origins, I thought it appropriate to pick up an instrument that would bring me back to one of my parents' heritage, and I chose the Chinese zither because of its similarities with the harp, especially when you play glissandos. It is the only instrument besides the harp that can create this cascading effect. The blood, the sweat, the tears from the numerous hours of practicing and perfecting a piece, being at the center of hundreds of people, interpreting the pieces and performing it in my own unique way. My journey as a musician laid the building blocks for my growing confidence and paved the way for my leadership, public speaking and advocacy skills, which inevitably has brought me to where I am now in my career. It sounds pretty cliche, but the main reason I studied law was because I've always wanted to follow in my dear father's footsteps. I was inspired to advocate for the people that needed it most from my dear late father and my family. One of the cases that he conducted that I hold on to very, very dearly was one of a beautiful and young 14-year-old girl who had aspirations to become a doctor. I could relate to her goals and dreams in many ways. We both had the drive and hunger to succeed, and we both had aspirations to be in a profession that could help people along the way. Unfortunately, she was caught up in a very, very bad traffic accident and ended up being paralyzed from chest down. My dad fought extremely hard to give her the compensation that she needed for her family and for herself from the drunk driver who hit her. I recall very well the meeting that I had with my father after judgment was handed down. The outpour of love and gratitude was immense, and I remember so well the tears that just fell from my eyes, seeing how determined she was to keep living her life no matter the condition she was in. I was heartbroken and devastated that her dreams and aspirations were shattered by someone else's negligence, and it made me even more determined to seek justice for those who have been hurt or wronged in life. This was the first time I understood and, uh, about law and how approaching it with empathy by placing myself in the shoes of the plaintiff, relating to how her family have felt during the litigation, has shed some light into how my origins of my legal career stemmed from empathy and how that has been challenged on my way up the career ladder and how I was ultimately able to embrace my origins. What is it about law that lends itself to music and vice versa? Are they that really irreconcilable? Did you know that Tchaikovsky and, and Sibelius received legal training as well at some point in their lives? The very nature of law is, like music, rooted in conflict and harmony. I feel that it has something to do with the parallels between process and form. In the way that I understand legal argument to be structured around precedent, so musical composition 
for all its creative spark and genius begins with form, sonata form, rondo form, symphonic form. More often than not, a composer chooses a key. And similarly, a legal president may be challenged, but is argued on the basis of what already exists as law. The heart of music is the interplay of the physical and the mental, as the compromise between forms a cohesive whole. Compromise is also the heart of the legal process, trying to find common ground and consensus solutions to problems of society through open communication. Both music and law have complemented my career throughout these years. Similarities in the structure, constraints, and form of musical composition and legal writing abound on several levels. Music stands for the deeply rooted harmony and life that cannot be verbalized. It was heard as embodying reality and manifesting music intrinsic values that related to morality. Law has often been seen as a kind of social music, the music of the court. This idea of law as composition is finding new resonance today. Precedents are sometimes seen as scores of music and lawgivers are likened to composers. I have reaped and enjoyed the benefits of my musical nurturing. It has brought me closer to embracing other people's feelings, to step in their shoes and have a better understanding of what empathy entails. This has helped me immensely in my career now as an advocate and as a judge. My father actually wanted me to pursue music. I even gave up a scholarship to attend Juilliard, the prestigious music conservatory in New York, because I wanted to follow in the footsteps of my dear late father. This was indeed a momentous and extremely difficult decision for me at the time. My father was concerned I would not be ruthless enough to deal with difficult clients and difficult counterparties. I did not let that deter me from going ahead with law, and I pursued it. Little did I know my father's words would indeed come true. The stresses of being a trainee solicitor disheartened me. I had files thrown in my face, doors slammed in my face. I was sleeping on average three or four hours a day, and I had to work weekends as well. Despite the long hours I put in, despite all the hard work and quality work I delivered, I was just not good enough, and I was not ruthless enough. I was treated in such a hostile manner, and I was told I would never ever succeed in the legal profession. Although I learned to be more firm and determined in time, what I was told I was not did not deter me from being the person I am today, or grew to become. I wanted to grow up to become someone with empathy, and to be an advocate with empathy for others. Whilst enduring two grueling years of my traineeship, I was upset that I gave up such a great opportunity at Juilliard. I thought the legal profession was supposed to be glamorous. Little did I know I was proved so wrong. But was I disenchanted? Was I disheartened? No. I have no regrets for where I am in my career now. I was very fortunate to have been referred and recommended to sit as a deputy magistrate at Eastern Magistracy for two months. This was a huge achievement for me, considering barristers with a criminal background were usually picked to sit. Given the number of years I had struggled throughout my legal career, this triumph was a huge validation for me and confirmed once again that all the long hours I pulled in was really worth it. The final trial that I was conducting was a controversial one, which ended up being reported in the various local newspapers in Hong Kong. The gist and brief facts of the case was that a domestic helper was hired to help feed a paralyzed, bedridden old man. He was left unable to speak because of a stroke. Thankfully, the CCTV footage installed by his wife in the apartment covered the cruelty that he had to endure. He was assaulted by her with a plastic stool. 
He had his penis pulled and he was fed feces. Regarding the brief facts of the case, immediately took me on a journey from the courtroom back to my home. My dear late father was in the late stages of his fibrosis and was pretty much confined to his room, to his chair and to his bed. My mother was pretty much his 24-hour carer in the last six months of his life. It was one of the toughest periods in my entire life and I had to wear so many different hats running my own law firm, sitting as a deputy magistrate, spending as much time as I could with my dad. I struggled immensely. Being a carer for my dad was even more the reason why I felt such deep injustice for the paralyzed man. I know my family and friends, especially my parents, were in awe of how I could make time for everyone and everything that I cared about and deeply loved. I could feel the whole world crashing down on me, but I endured and I managed to deal with everything. It was all the more important that justice was served. The dear old man should have had the happiest moments of his life instead of having to endure the abuse he did. I ended up convicting the domestic helper for four months imprisonment and for two counts of common assault. The reactions I got from my colleagues, people in the legal profession, even the defense counsel, well, and lawyers aside and court reporters and the journalists and the public was that we need more empathetic judges like you. I graciously accepted this as a compliment because it was truly a milestone in my career. It was the first time someone expressly embraced my softness instead of dismissing it. A judge needs to be empathetic in order to see why people do the things that they do not just to decide what happened, but why it happened. You really need to have empathy because though I would think that the law is very clear, it is not always completely clear. Actions in the courtroom spoke for itself, but most important of all, when I stepped out of the courtroom and back home, I saw my dear father place all the newspaper snippets onto placards for me to show me when I got home. He was indeed very, very proud of me, not only because my ruling was fair and reasonable on both sides of the spectrum, but for all the emotions I had to endure during the trial and the tears I could not shed for the paralyzed old man. My father could read my mind and saw from my eyes how painful it was for me to go through the facts of the case. And it connected the victim to my father's deteriorated condition. A week later, he passed away. Life takes us through different journeys and we will always grow as a person. In the greater scheme of things, your perceptions of who you are today will never change your core. Those are the values that are brought about by your origins, how your parents saw the world, how your parents treated others, the values that they instilled in you and your upbringing. There is no doubt I embrace the strength, how females can be empathetic yet successful leaders. The expressions and emotions from my journey and my roots in music help me to understand the meaning of gracing other people's feelings and the importance of connecting to people. This case made me realize and empathy is integral to being a good judge. Women are always told to set aside and abandon the soft side of femininity in order to portray a tough and ruthless persona. This should not be the case at all. And it was a lesson I learned when I was told I was not ruthless enough. We all have to embrace femininity to keep the status quo. Embrace your femininity may seem like an abstract concept. You might wonder if that means hugging yourself or singing a loud rendition of, I am woman, hear me roar. But femininity begins with an acceptance of who you are at the core. You don't have to be a girly girl to be feminine. 
Femininity is whatever this idea means to you. So the first step to embracing your femininity is the vision for womanhood. For you, femininity may involve lunar studies, fashion design, makeup, or loving art. It's only about you. It's about embracing your core. And this concept about embracing your core is so, so, so important. Who you are as a woman and what you are as feminine, no matter what you might look or feel like. Embracing femininity can be as simple as thinking about the people in your life that you admire and considering why you are so proud of them. And then add yourself to that list. My passion remains very much a huge part of my life and the skills that I learned during my musical studies has helped pave the way to where I am in my legal career now. Empathy, being comfortable interpreting things in my own unique way and own unique style and being comfortable performing in front of a crowd. It remains a huge part of my soul and I am forever grateful to my dear parents and especially my dear late father, family and friends who have been my rock, my pillar and my strength throughout all these years. I hope you all take something out of this and I thank you.